Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And uh, today we got a big crossover uh, in comics uh, that we're going to be talking about. But first, got to let you guys know about the Patreon. Uh, hit the link in the description below. Join our Patreon and uh, that affords you the videos before anybody else. If you're a King Kayfaber level Patreon supporter, you're watching us uh, stream this live and you're getting all the videos before anybody else. But we are makers of comics. Before you is a bibliography of our current works. Uh, two Red Room trade paperbacks are out there. Four Hip Hop Family Tree volumes are out there, but uh, we're going to be selling a, an omnibus at the end of this year, uh, collecting all the Hip Hop Family Tree volumes and uh, 140 pages of additional material. As of this recording, it's $50 on Amazon. It's going to be $75 at the end of the day, so get the big discount uh, sooner than later. Uh, three volumes, X-Men Grand Design, and uh, WYSIWYG is out there. Jimmy has Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive on the stands. Uh, Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is able to be pre-ordered at this very moment and going to be in your comic shops before you know it. What he does have out right this very minute, though, is Hulk Grand Design. So scoop that up before it disappears. Man, I see those things flying off the shelves these days. And uh, Plain Janes is another one of uh, Jimmy's comics. But uh, we are also selling... The new round of Red Room comics to your local comic shop. Crypto Killers is the name. These are the covers. The Eddie P variant, Jim Rugg variant, Peach Momoko variant, and we do have a sketch cover variant. So now that we're done paying the bills, Jimmy, let's look at one of the most outlandish uh, crossovers in, in comic history. And dare I say, probably doesn't age so well. Uh, this is before Columbine, 1994 is uh, the date on it. And I just don't think that that Archie, nor Punisher, nor, nor Marvel, would want to deign to bring uh, guns in schools or anything like that. This is a strange, strange book. And I gotta, gotta cut him a little bit right here for 48 pages, no ads. Reading this this week, I don't know if that's a plus. Uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get into it then. We'll get into it. I had a fun time reading this thing. It is funny, the crossover you've been dreading. Who puts that on the cover? <laughs> it was the apathetic 1990s. The, I guess the, so. the same era of OK Cola and Hagar, the horrible cola. Super bizarre. Nirvana, Super bizarre. grunge, all that stuff. I actually had no idea that there was an Archie version. I, I, this is always the version that I knew. This is the version that I saw in uh, We Know Wizard magazine or the solicitations through through uh, Marvel Comics, because guess what? You might not know this, but I didn't grab Archie Comics when, when I had some say in it. Uh, they do show the Stan Goldberg pencils for uh, for this cover in the back of the Marvel published version. Stan Goldberg, interesting character in the, in the history of comics. The, the earliest Marvel colorist. He colored Marvel Comics number one, and he created the color schemes for all, all the classic Marvel costumes in the earliest days. Uh, the color was done, the, the design, the, what do you call it, man? The, the, the guides uh, for color were done at the last minute uh, before they went to press in the old Silver Age Marvels. There was never a credit for who uh, the colorist was until much later, but uh, he was at the helm of uh, very many of the color guides. Uh, but his artistic credits, pretty much all I know is... Uh, is the Archie stuff. Look at the cleanup on the on the Uzi going from the pencils to the inks. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a damn water pistol, man. That's funny. It's a super soaker. Yeah, this is a bizarre artifact. I don't know. I, I bought this after the fact. I'm sure this was an oddity that I found somewhere and went, ooh, this sound, you know, this is funny. Um, bizarre that it exists. You yeah. Know, one of the weirder things that I could come up with, and if you just said this was your idea you would be shot down so fast. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody's agreeing to this. Batten Lash is the guy who, who uh, seemingly made it work uh, in, a, in a way that Marvel was happy with and, and uh, Archie was happy with. You got some of the intro pieces here. And it does seem like it's a story that comes out of San Diego Comic-Con. You know, something, you, you go to Nobu out there in San Diego, man, and you're getting a little soused, I think is how you say it, man. A little sauced. Ideas abound. And maybe... These New Yorkers, you know, Archie, MLJ, that's 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 New York based. I was pre I'm pretty sure Marvel certainly was at the time. So they're all jet lagged and drunk. <laughs> and uh, you come up with Punisher meets Archie, the, the most unlikely pairings. Tom Palmer on inks. And it says wholeheartedly that he's the anchor of all this stuff. I love this part where they're giving the origins of both in different fonts. Right. And in, in, in a way, I feel like it sums up both of these companies. The sure. font choice, not, not, not the particular origins. Right. 
starts off in a great Buscema fashion, probably a guy who's been working from plots at this point for 30 years. So he's visualizing these stories, doing everything how to draw comics the Marvel way. What'd you see? Look at how poorly my copy is printed with the black off register. So you can see like this halo effect of different color. Yours is totally tight, but I have almost my whole book is this way where you're getting like a, almost a white around your black line yeah. because of the off registration and the problem with trapping back then. Yeah, no fun. It's nice that they're not all that way. Sure. And, and you know what? It's possible that if you bought another Archie one, maybe, maybe it would it would be tighter. You know, sometimes those things slip. But we have uh, Punisher tracking down a dude, and you don't see him until a few pages later when he has this ghastly visage right there, man. Look at that guy. That's a bad customer. I was trying to figure out, who's drawing that? Is that a John Buscema character? That feels like a... You could, like It's got all these lines and stuff, man. So I'm feeling like Buscema's doing his best uh, Archie bad guy by way of Harvey Kurtzman and Mad Magazine kind of. Kind of vibe. See, did you you praise my my trappings? But then I, ah, I get pages where it's dude, shoddy. You're right. Yeah, you're right. And that's a good page on mine. So <laughs> it's it's a sign of the time, you know. Like this is a newsprint comic, so it probably would have been the end days of them pr printing on like web presses and getting that shoddy registration. And I didn't realize it, but a uh, a Batman crossover as well. Yes, sir. They they call out Gotham a couple of times, probably even at the end. Uh, you flip the page, and then you have a straight-up uh, Archie-looking comic. But it does have the same hand of uh, the the traditional kind of Marvel lettering. Uh, if you take a look at the cover, like almost all panels would have these big, airy letters. Because these are comics definitely for little kids. Uh, and they didn't keep that part with uh, the Archie part of the comic. Uh, so when you're going through this and you flip, you get a couple Marvel pages, you get a couple Archie pages, and then they start to do the jam comic after a little while. And that's and that's when things are are, are really fun. Uh, a lot of inside jokes in this uh, in this book, thanks They're to the Batman Lash and crew. Really hard. That first panel is just loaded to the point of I was rereading that being like, okay, hold on, what? <laughs> right. Which one? This this panel? No, this one. Because they're, they're making jokes. It's a comedy club, but I thought it was a comic book store at first. Totally. Yeah, and, and, and Pep Comics is the first appearance of, of Archie in the old MLJ days. And that bad guy, his name is Mel J, like MLJ, uh, a.k.a. Montana Bob, Bob Montana, creator of uh, Archie and uh, Freckles. That's just there for fun. But this lets you know, man, uh, uh, Punisher is on the track of this of this uh, MLJ Montana Bob character and tracks him down to Riverdale. I always see a little bit of Mark Silvestri, Dan Green in these John Buscema pages. Sure. And uh, man, I'm sad that's not that that hasn't continued to be a part of Mark Silvestri's style. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like he he dumbed down. For, for the audience and doubled his dollars, man, when he went the Jim Lee, uh, Scott Williams route. So now we introduce this uh, Bizarro World Archie guy into the world of Archie with all the same deals, uh, all the same problems and issues of uh, your standard Archie comic. Ver Veronica wants to get back at Archie, is going to go with this uh, lookalike dude. Some of the most interesting part of this book for me is seeing Tom Palmer's inks on this kind of Stan Goldberg Archie style. Sure. Yeah, it'll be bits like this where, where it's like you could almost see too much Dracula guy. Yeah, it's, it's very bizarre and it makes sense that you'd have the same inker to try to tie two different pencilers and styles together. Yeah. But it does uh, it does bend the Archie style a little bit in it a does. way that I find interesting. Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, this is him doing his Archie version of a background, but then pun this is Riverdale. So this is the John Buscema version of a realistic Riverdale, which I think is very, very awesome because, I mean, it's a throwback town. Man, look at the wildness of the perspective on those pictures. Dude, you have to put the, you have to put micro trip has to sit on the inside. There's no here. grid. There's no grid being applied to that, that perspective. Yeah, I think he's batting this one out pretty quick. And it's these kind of bits that I dig. And I, I do wonder, you know, does Stan Goldberg have to, like, go go kick it at uh, John Buscema's studio to draw in his guys kind of kind of quick or something? Because it's, it's definitely, I think it's probably Buscema doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I like to imagine them drawing inspiration from the Megaton Man Savage Dragon crossover. Right. Probably, so, probably on both of their tables. Stuff like that probably even just made this possible, to be honest. 
It is funny whenever it's not the Punisher, like just having like these grunts grab an Archie. It, it, like it could be a super weird Archie comic. Totally. Where he gets messed up with gangsters. Yeah. And, and it has that uncanny thing, you know, it's, it's that there's formal play here, even with such a goofball thing by just having these kind of panels, you know, it's not so far off from like in Pictopia or one of those deconstructions of, of the comic book medium. Uh, cause Bat and Lash, he, he's an outsider of both. Like he's not, he's never was a mainstream dude. He was doing Wolf and Bird, Counselors of the Macabre. I don't, and I don't know any of his other credits. Yeah, I don't know either. if he even has any other credits. Uh, so he never did Archie comics and, and he never did Marvel comics. So he's the writer of both. And he kind of could, could kind of see both from the outside and kind of, you know, make fun of them suitably with like weird Punisher word journal captions and stuff like that. They got the whole gang in here, dude. Look, it's Josie and the Pussycats. Yeah, that one looks like a struggle. For, for I don't know if it's Tom Palmer or Stan Goldberg, but boy, some of these pages do look like they were done quickly. Yeah, and I think all Archie pages are like that, man. I had two teachers at the Kubert School who were Archie guys. And uh, the one did, like definitely did not want to be an Archie dude, so they even like made... Mini, they made series for him where he could draw like kind of superhero-ish looking guys and stuff like that. But uh, if you want, if you want a raise at Archie, they'll give you more pages to draw. Like that's that kind of joint. And Stan Goldberg's name was on the, on a lot. Yeah, I used to collect those uh, Josie and the Pussycat, like the DiCarlo ones, the early ones. Sure, sure. And I I would scoop Archie comics up when I was a kid. They they were uh, at the hardware store. They were much cheaper. Like you could get them for like a quarter. And I was agnostic in my tastes. It's another insane page. Oh, that might be the thumbnail. <laughs> it should be. Just, the, just it's a perfect page. Yeah. It, it really is. It, it exemplifies that contrast in styles. Yeah. And and that's that's what you want when you have something like this, man. You you want to see you want to see Punisher and Archie in the same panel as much as possible. So something like this. Yeah. You know, it, that's almost like a panel of, of a Fanographics comic or something. I like to imagine too, like the the Punisher's disposition, like he's so frown, you know, he, he's uh, Judge Dredd without a helmet and all these. Yeah. And I like to imagine that's John Buscema, like looking at this, like what am I in for? That's what right. am I doing? I do think they dropped the ball. Are they the hot boxing in the car? Like, what is going on in in these panels where they're just all surrounded by smoke, sitting in this little tiny car in yeah. the middle of a suburb? Right. But there's such moments of brilliance, man, with uh, with Buscema, his drapery and stuff. I was staring at these figures a lot, and, and certainly Tom Palmer adds to the mixture. But all those folds feel like where they should be. He's phenomenal with these kinds of figures. Like, anything you want to do with a figure, Buscema is just on the money. He was almost the worst guy to do how to draw comics to Marvel way because it just didn't look real. Like, it was <laughs> right. impossible. <laughs> right. I could have drawn my entire life and never approached that kind of figure work. Yeah, totally. The uh, the bad Archie, this uh, Mel J guy, he's really trying to fuck Veronica. Like, he's trying to get her out of there, trying to sequester her, get her into a spot where he could lay, lay the game down. Pretty aggressive. Yeah. Man, and he looks like the devil. I can't believe any high school girl is falling for this dude. <laughs> and, you know, he's like... Uh, He's like the ringer on the the um, Little League World Series team, you know, because yeah. he's about 35 <laughs> years old. But he's sneaking in there. I actually remember as a kid, like when when I, when the big news before nine, like you know, on September 10th of uh, 2001, was uh, there was like a ringer who that they found out was like 22 years old or something playing on the Little League World Series team. I love all this kind of coloring where you have like very busy panels, but like all the background figures are just light blue or the foreground figures are just green or purple. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's a very effective way to keep your focus on the characters you want, but sure. still have a lot going on. Totally. I struggle with that in coloring. Yeah. I mean, you can't go wrong with these old, with these old methods, man. That sock panel, like that is perfect. How to draw comics the Marvel way, like show the end of the action and all of its dynamism. Yeah, even the dude getting hit has that effect. Totally, yeah, that dude got fucking walloped. And then you got your gun gunfight at the school. In the middle of a crowded, kid-filled room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is a crossover, right? So I, I think the cool thing with uh, The Punisher meets Archie is there's never a thought in mind that Archie's ever going to get one over because that's like where the crossovers fall apart. They're always going right. to meet in the middle and, 
everything's going to be good at the end of the day. But where they do keep strict with making sure that neither property is diminished is that whenever they get one over on the bad guy, you find out that he has a wig and they, they knock his wig off so that they could do the dastardly deed of, you know, sending him away in like a hot air balloon or whatever that is. But what I feel like should have happened, I feel like these are all calling attention to stuff. I don't know what this character is. Yeah, beats me. Because like Sonic was an Archie comic. Uh, the Shield is, is yep. old school MLJ character. So this is something, but I just don't know what it is. Bat, Bat and Lash is like one of the early uh, San Diego Comic-Con dudes you know so i think he's deep in comics and i'm sure all the old heads know what that character is they also run a gag through here where everybody's keeping a war journal exactly yeah yeah there's a there's it's, it's kind of funny i think but, betty gets one but like when when archie ha has his it's entry one mm -hmm. <laughs> some of those little details are pretty well played boy look at this for your early computer coloring and, and getting that expanded palette but Maybe using some colors that you should. <laughs> Just awful. <laughs> Just terrible. There's that dog character again. Blue's Clues. Yeah, well, no clue what that is. It's well, funny. When we dispatch our baddie, though, you see the wig gets knocked off, and he just gets caught up and gets gets floated away on uh, the sh the shield balloon. I really think like, okay, if we if we get the if we get the wig off of him and, and we make clear that that's not Archie. Yeah, turn that motherfucker to Swiss cheese. You gotta shoot a million bullets in them because the 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 image of it of an Archie getting shot with like a million fucking holes. I, I would pay double the price. For, yeah, you're probably for that, right for that comic that. as an ending because like it turns this is an Archie book now. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. There's nothing Marvel about it. Just from a pure horror horror kind of moment. If Punisher plugs this balloon whenever it's about <laughs> 2,000 feet up in the air, that's a pretty sloppy ending, too. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Jim, you're sick, man. <laughs> oh, Betty's diary here at the end. <laughs> the diary gimmick's funny. Yeah, it makes so much sense. I wanted to do, whenever I was doing those, um, whatever the, the, the weird comics were for Marvel, that I had done, like Brother Voodoo and, mm -hmm. and that one... I wanted. I had a Punisher script that I'd written, and it's him like war journaling in the van, like stalking some crack house whenever an old lady gets mugged. <laughs> but it's him kind of like that diary gimmick to me was the funniest thing. Although that said, I think everybody should keep one of those things, like a journal. Yeah. Like anybody that does anything, keep those journals because like it's hard to find records of any of this it, stuff, especially as the years go by. Yeah. I was reading a bunch of uh, like. Punisher Volume 1, Mike Barron, Klaus Janssen, and a little bit beyond. And it's it's incredible the amount of room they have to play with, with what was going on in 80s America. And it, it's hitting all the bases. It's hitting, like, Jamestown, like, cults. It's hitting um, dirty bomb kind of things. Uh, certainly drug stuff, corrupt politician. Like, it's, it's it hits all the... The perfect marks. And the War Journal, I think that is a... Uh, the the function of that sort of thing is... Uh, and the problem with Punisher is that he doesn't have anybody to talk to, man. So, so like, you can't get too much character across with the guy, you know? Like, this is his, his closest dude, this type of shit, who's fucking hooking him up with technology and stuff. Yeah, I don't want to do stereotypes based on how someone looks, but it's surprising microchips not on lists. Yeah. <laughs> so the last couple panels, uh, next stop Gotham City, uh, implying the soup, the, uh, <laughs> the 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 Punisher. I mean, Punisher Batman happens at the same time, pretty much. Uh, so I think that's a little call out to that. And then the last one is uh, Wolverine meets Jughead. Yeah, unfortunately, we never got that one. Um, you know what? I do want to just reflect for one minute or two on this opening sure. statement because they, they right in the very beginning say this idea started as a joke, but it was an idea that would capture the attention of comic book collectors and uh, publishers had to like the big sales part of that. Yeah. Like right in the beginning, they call that out. Page one, page yeah. one, paragraph one. That's what they talk about. And, you know, this is this is like that classic like uh, swindler con man kind of thing. Like they're telling you right up front what this is. This is just a cash grab. And then they connect over here with Marvel being like, this is our first uh, intercompany crossover in many years. And then if you follow the couple of years after this, 
boy, it's on. They're crossing over with Image. They're crossing over with Marvel. It is like, or I mean with DC, you know, like once they open the doors to like, how do we do this? And with sales in mind, it is just on. Let's cross yeah. over as much as we can. Let's try to cash in on this. But the amazing thing to me is they say it before they even get us into the comic. They say exactly what their sales, what this is. Yeah. I mean, 1994, I'm, I'm 12 years old and that was not lost on me. Like there's no other reason to do something like that other than to uh, create spectacle and to get people to, co- to come see it. And uh, for as fanboy as these fucking fanboys can be, 90% of them must know it. You know, that, that that that's what this is. Yeah, I, I would think so. I would certainly think so. And um, you know what? Now that I think we've gone through this, I think the way this came onto my radar is one of those, like, uh, you know, the strangest comics. Like, the, uh, that yeah, kind of book. Yeah. I think we've looked at that before. Yeah, the Leather, leather, leather ex- Nun or excerpts. something. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if we looked at the whole thing or just excerpts, but um, I went through that book when I got it and was just, like, tracking stuff down, and I think that's probably how I ended up with a copy of this. It is a strange one. Probably the only Marvel comic in that list. I'll also say this. We've looked at a few of these intercompany crossovers. I'd say this is as well done as, as any of that I can think of. I mean, I think this is better for those reasons that going into it, you'd never think that there's going to be a schmoz with the two that's going to end in a tie like every other one because you cannot, it doesn't make any sense to participate in a union and have your character be the bitch. It doesn't make, it, there's no reason to do that. Uh, and if you go into it with that fanboy thing in mind and you think that you're going to see so, like, you know, like this, a score is going to be settled and, and you know, some old, uh, you know, schoolyard argument is going to be... Finally going to get the answer. Who's tougher, Wolverine or Batman? Yeah. Like if you aren't disappointed every time, probably the second, this, like thinking about the, uh, like what would the good ones be? Maybe, maybe the second best one is like the X, the X-Men Teen Titans or something where it's just acknowledged, like we have to get together and, and take care of this like terrible foe with no real schmoz or whatever, just trying to make a good story with these two characters. There's no weird time loop to get you in one universe to the next. It's like the X-Men know that the Teen Titans exist and vice versa. Let's get together to go do a thing. Yeah, dicey. Like, like uh, you do the job for the paycheck. You know, Marvel DC hits us up and said, hey, man, you want to have an imp- a cartoonist cafe of imprint where all you do is crossovers? You do it. But then you got to really try to figure out how to make it work because uh, nobody has figured that out yet. Yeah, we'd have Frank Castle sitting in on the on the flip. <laughs> yeah. What books you want to look at, Frank? Probably Nom. I bet we'd get into the Nom. Let's get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available, and hit the Patreon uh, at the link in the description below. King K Fabers, get uh, our videos before anybody else, and they're sitting with us while we record these things. But the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. So, Jimmy, let the people know what you have out there, man. Street Angel Princess of Poverty, that's the next one. That is the one to pre order right now, wherever you get your books from Image Comics. It will collect all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, which is also available. Uh, I also have the Plain Janes and Hulk Grand Design, so pick those up and uh, join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see lots more of my comics, download out of print zines and minis, and you can see the comics that I am working on now. 2023 is a year of cartoonist kayfabe. Uh, There are two volumes of Red Room out uh, on the stands right now. We are soliciting to your local comic shop the latest round of Red Room comics called Crypto Killer is going to start coming out in May, but your store needs to order it sooner than later. Uh, these are the various covers. There's the Eddie P variant, Jim Rugg, my co-host here on Cartoonist Kayfabe with his Rob Liefeld inspired variant, Peach Momoko, and we will have a sketch cover variant with that. Uh, at the end of uh, 2023, in time for Christmas, uh, there will be the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus collecting the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree that are out there right now. 504 pages plus 140 pages that are not in those original four volumes. As of this recording right now, the book is 50 bucks on, on Amazon. It's going to be $75 when it hits the stores, man. So if you have it in your mind to get it, scoop that thing up sooner than later. Uh, three volumes, X-Men Grand Design are out in the wild and uh, WYSIWYG. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, fanny packs, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All great ways to support the channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Read more comics.